before we get started in this full length two hour MA2 crash course, I wanna state a couple of things up front and let you guys kind of put this in perspective. And I wanna make sure that you know that learning MA2 is not an overnight process. It's not even uh, something that you could learn in a week or a month or even a year. It is a continual process where um, you need to kind of establish a repetitious way of learning as you are using the hardware and software. And this video is pretty much designed to give you a foot in the door because not everybody can uh, be lucky enough or fortunate enough to have access to one of these machines. And they really are machines. At the heart of it, it is just a computer uh, in a fancy case with uh, some faders and a whole bunch of buttons and uh, screens that look really complex on the surface. But underneath, uh, it's, it's really not that complex. And I'm kind of hoping to uh, illustrate that in this video and give you the resources that you need to kind of start learning on your own. And I am titling this as a crash course because I know I've personally been in the situation where I've had to learn how to use this console pretty much overnight. And uh, you can kind of fake it till you make it in some regard, but uh, hopefully this video will uh, give you a good jumping off point. And if you do not have time to watch the full two hours down below in the description, there is a, uh, an index um, or table of contents, if you will, um, with timestamps to show you where everything is. So if you're stuck on one particular thing, you can go check out down below and go directly to that point. I also wanna say thank you to all of my supporters over on Patreon. They are the ones who support this content and make it happen. So if you wanna support as well, um, head on over to the link also down below in the description. Anything is appreciated. I'm going to presume you know at least a little bit about lighting and DMX and that you've kind of been tasked with the situation at hand of getting a show up and running on MA2 after it's been flown and uh, all the lights are in the air plugged in and ready for signal. I'll be simulating the lighting rig with a program called Capture, Capture 2019 Symphony Edition. It's what I use to pre -vis and design all of the shows that I design and um, you'll see that kind of pop in and out on the screen, different overlays on different sections of the console. Um, and please note that this video is in 4K60. So if you do have a monitor, make sure to go full screen, make sure to check the little gear icon down in the corner, make sure you're at the highest possible settings because there's a lot of detail that um, you might not be able to see if you're looking on a phone screen or something like that. So without further ado, let's uh, head over to the console and get into it. All right, and here we are. We have our blank slate. Uh, in this example video, I'm using an MA2 light, um, but this will apply to any size of console. So uh, I'm using an MA2 light because it's what I own and it's, I would say, probably the most common desk you will run across. Uh, if you run into an MA2, chances are, it's probably going to be a light. Um, so first things first, once you have run power to your desk and you've gotten it uncased, um, we're going to flip the switch on in the back. I've already done that. And then hit our power button on the front. And that's going to start, a, start our boot up process. So you'll see our uh, channel page and fader page buttons blinking back and forth. And at this point we can see that our software version is 3.5.0.6. Now, the first three digits of that is the, uh, it's called the streaming version. And the streaming version has to be the same across uh, all of the things you have in the network that are MA2, right? So if you wanna network two desks together or uh, a desk and an NPU, really any sort of hardware, uh, they need to be running the same streaming version. So that's that first three digits. So 3.5.0, that's the streaming version. Um, so we're just about finished booting up here and we are presented with uh, what in my opinion is a far scarier site than what you would see on any complex show file. And that is a completely empty show file. Um, so we are kind of simulating the idea here that we've just been handed a paper patch sheet for a show where you've been called in to um, to be the programmer because someone called in sick 
and you raised your hand and said, uh, uh, I know how to use MA. Um, so maybe you're uh, back in catering on your lunch break watching this, trying to figure out how to use this console. It looks complex, I know it looks complex, but I'm going to distill this down into hopefully about uh, an hour worth of material. And if you don't have a whole hour to watch this, there are uh, little index notes down below, I think that direction in the, uh, in the description. So be sure to check that out if you don't have the full amount of time here. So what we're looking at here is totally blank, new initialized show file. And I wanna point out a couple of things before we get started and we dive right into it. So uh, we've got our two main screens up here and then our command screen. The command screen is always referred to as screen number one. The screen directly above that, also called the uh, programmer or um, encoder bar screen, that's screen two and screen three over here. And if we had a full size, the, the fourth screen would be screen four over there. But uh, yeah, I'm not quite that rich. I've just got the light today. Um, we'll also note that there's a couple of sections to these screens. Anywhere you see these, like this white dot grid, that's what's called the user defined area of the screen. Um, you can see we've got a user defined area down here on screen one. We have a user defined area on screen two and screen three, of course. So that is the section where we can kind of customize the user interface to be whatever we want. And we can even make different uh, views and we can switch between them. So in this video, we're going to create a programming view and we're also going to create a playback view. Uh, below the, uh, actually let's start over here. On screen number two, we have a non-user defined section. And this is kind of the, uh, the masters and encoder bar section. Uh, we don't see anything filled in quite here yet because we, we haven't patched any fixtures that have any um, preset types. But when we do that, this will be filled in with things like dimmer, position, gobo, color, um, all the different attributes you're used to working with with fixtures. And uh, I'm not gonna dumb this down to like, uh, I don't even understand what DMX is level, but uh, if you're watching this, I presume you understand DMX, you understand patching, um, and I'm going to kind of show you the MA way of getting a show up and running really fast, or as fast as I can practically show you. Um, above our uh, encoder section here, we have uh, a command line. We have one here and then we also have one on um, screen one. They both do the same thing. If you type um, if you type something in one, it shows up in the other. Um, but the important thing I wanna show you here is the command line feedback window we can open if we hit the yellow dot, okay? If we open this, this shows a history of all of the commands that we have sent to the desk and, um, and it's a really, really good tool for learning how the desk kind of um, speaks, right? Because it is using a command line language. So you have, uh, just like any other language, you have objects and verbs and syntax. It's really just like speaking a very basic um, form of a new language if you were to learn a language. So uh, if we look over on our keypad section, this is like our programmer, this is like the hard keys for our programmer. Um, we have a couple of different groupings here. We have like the keypad, uh, uh, which is obviously just like a 10 key keypad with some modifiers. We have uh, a section here that uh, are like actions or verbs. This whole section right here is for, for verbs. And this whole section here is for um, objects, objects that we can store into the MA's file system. Um, and so the whole job of the programmer really is to store data into the file system of the MA and then make it easy to play back. So I'm gonna walk you through that as well. So again, we have actions or verbs if you wanna consider them that, and then um, objects, uh, with the exception of go to. Go to is like the, the one orphan from the rest of these. So everything over here except for go to, um, is, uh, is, an, is a, an object, right? Uh, and then all, the, all these other buttons up here, these are just to assist in programming. Okay, all right, we're, we're getting through the basics here. Um, 
you'll also see that there is a grayed out channel in brackets. And you'll also notice that my channel button is illuminated, even though I have nothing, I've, I'm cleared out, it's nothing, that's just how the console booted up. So this grayed out keyword is referred to as the, the default keyword, okay? So um, this means that if you just start typing numbers without typing an object first, it's just gonna presume that you mean channel. Oh, and if you want to change this default uh, keyword, you can just hit an object and hit please. And now our grayed out keyword is fixture, uh, which I'm going to use in this instance. So, okay, we've kind of gone through the layout of how it looks like when you've got nothing going on here. Um, let's go ahead and start patching some lights. Again, we're going to pretend that we just got handed this sheet of paper. We have nothing else to go on except for the stage that we're looking at. Let's presume that the stage is already built. And uh, yeah, let's start by patching some lights. So I'm noticing here that we have a bunch of Altman scoops for house lighting and they're all patched to the same address. Now I could go through and patch all of these. It's like probably 30 or so fixtures, but um, that seems like a waste of my time. So I'm going to patch first by hitting setup and I'm going to take this screen and change it to screen two. So it's a little easier to see. We will go to patch and fixture schedule and we are prompted with this layer name pop out, pop up, excuse me. Um, I tend to label all of my layers and organize them by fixture type. It's just easier for me to remember. Um, sometimes you can uh, assign layers by location. Um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of theories on, on how to do this, but I will tell you in my experience, the most common way you will see this done is by fixture type. So I'm going to label this as house lights and I'm going to be prompted with uh, selecting a fixture type for our house lights. Now these are all just one channel dimmers. So dimmer is already in our show file and I'm going to rename this as house lights one. Now, anytime you name a fixture in here and you end it with a number, it's going to sequentially add. So if I were to add um, 36 of these or however many there are, then it would fill in one through 36. However, since they're all patched to the same uh, universe and address, I'm just gonna patch one of them. Um, and I'm going to call this fixture ID 10. And then channel ID, I'm not going to put anything on there. And we can see that our patch is at F1, which is universe 6.1. That's the way Capture um, does it. So we can see here, we've got our house lights layer and we have one fixture in there with fixture ID 10 as our house lights. Cool, let's move on to the next layer. And next up we have a couple of source fours. So I'm gonna go S4 Lico. I know that's not uh, really a correct way of saying it, but uh, let's just go, let's go and do the same thing here. Lico one quantity of, we see here we have six and fixture ID one through six. And I just have to put the first fixture ID in. I'm going to delete channel ID. I'll tell you why in a second here. And we can see that our addresses are one, two, three, four, five, and six on universe D. So 4.1 is universe D. And we can see our auto numbering for the fixtures has taken place as well as the auto naming. Next layer up, I believe we've got, uh, all right, we've got eight vipers create a layer called Vipers, and I'm gonna go into the library and search for manufacturer Martin Viper profile. Make sure we have 16-bit extended mode 34 channel. Make sure that all matches up, 34 channel. And we have eight of these. I'm gonna rename Viper one. Fixture ID starts at 101. And our addressing is split up a little bit here. So I'm gonna show you a trick if you have split addressing. Uh, I can notice that because we've got universe B and universe C. So if I don't put any patch in here, it imports the fixtures, it gives them a fixture ID, but there's no patch. Okay, keep in mind that you don't have to have any fixtures patched in order to program with the fixtures. This is a really like useful, powerful thing about MA. 
Um, when you import a fixture into this patch, um, the, the DMX patch is like the last thing that is considered when, uh, when, you, when it's like outputting the data, when it's like crunching all the numbers in the back end. So all of your data, all your presets, all of your programming is stored into fixture, uh, this fixture. It doesn't even have to have a fixture ID number, just this line, it is all the data is stored in there. So we can see our first four fixtures are in universe B sequentially. So I'm gonna highlight those by clicking and dragging with my finger, hitting please, and then typing in 2.1 and it's gonna fill in that whole range, okay? Now I'm gonna do the same thing for the second segment here. Uh, and we'll go 3.1 for universe C. And just double check, just cross check, make sure that your numbers match, okay? Should be easy enough. Uh, we've got a set of 12 pointies. Again, we're gonna go into the library and we're gonna search for row B, pointy, and that's in mode one, 24 channel mode. Boom, so pointy one, we've got 12 of them, starting at fixture ID 201. Again, these are split up, so I'm not gonna hit, pa I'm not gonna hit patch yet. I'm just going to go and highlight, in this case, it's the first six, and put the first start address in. Again, just cross check, do a quick little check to make sure everything is accurate. New layer. Quantum wash. And we've got the extended mode, which means that it has the different rings that we can control. So there's like an outer ring, an inner ring, and then like a center cluster that we can control with this. And I'll show you how to how to deal with that in a minute. I put I put some like little tricky things in this whole setup that we're going to go over. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll explain to that when we, I'll explain about that when we get there. Okay, so we'll import extended mode 33 channel. And we have four of these. I'm just gonna call this Q wash. We have, uh, excuse me, we have six of these. They start at fixture number 301. And the universe is A289 or 1.289. Okay, here's an important thing I wanna show you. Fixture IDs, up until now, we've only seen whole numbers. Uh, well, excuse me, uh, numbers without a decimal point. Um, but when we imported these quantum washes, you see this decimal, it says 301.1. That indicates that this is a multi-instance fixture. Okay, and that means that it's like a compound fixture where you've got like, a main moving light, and then you've got like different segments of LED rings. The way MA deals with it is by um, having different instances. So 301.1 is the first instance of that first quantum wash. I hope that makes sense. And then it just kind of goes on from there. You can have, <laughs> I'm actually not sure what the limit is on the number of instances in a fixture, but uh, you can have whole universes dedicated to these really big LED fixtures sometimes. Um, moving on, we'll talk a little bit about progr programming that in a second. We got our atomic layer, atomic 3004 channel, import, four of them, 401, and 3.281. And then lastly, our color forces, oh, paper flying all over the place. We have eight color forces. CF-72s, big boys. Uh, this is Color Force, whoops, spell correctly. Color Force 72, mode three, 12 channel or 12 uh, instance RGB mode. Boom. CF-72, one, we've got eight of them, 501 and they start at 1.1. Oh, okay, so we have a slight overlap here. Let's figure out why this is. Maybe I selected the wrong mode. So we can go back, here's another trick. You can select an entire column of data by tapping the title column. 
okay, and then clicking with our screen encoder. So we've got our four main encoders underneath the programming section, and then each screen has its own dedicated encoder, each main screen, I should say, the command screen doesn't. Um, but this, this encoder screen will also work for items that are selected here. So we can click, go to Color Force, and go to our 36 channel, mode three. So I had the wrong mode selected. Um, and we can go in here and do our patch again. This time it should work perfectly well. Sorry about that. So cross check again, 253 is our last address, sweet. So we have not saved anything to our show file yet. All these edits have been done without saving. And when we hit exit, we get prompted with a warning screen and you pretty much always just say yes to this. And now we can see that our encoder bar has filled up with all of our preset types. And if we hit setup and go to patch and fixture schedule, all of our fixtures are patched. Sweet. And at this point, I'm going to save my show file. I'm going to save as MA2 Crash Course 101. And I've saved that to our internal drive. If I had a flash drive connected here, it would pop up under here, right next to templates. And now that our fixtures are patched, we need to output DMX to what we're controlling. Now, right now we're not in a session. We can see that because we have a, a red broken heart. Very sad, I know. Um, however, when we're not in a session, we can still output DMX if our station has DMX outputs like on the back, okay? And in this case, um, the MA2 Lite has six uh, inherent outputs and there's a, an input that you can flip around to be an output. But for the, for the sake of simplicity, we have six DMX outputs here. And we can see those six outputs if we go into setup and network configuration. Um, under our consoles tab, since we have a console connected, we can see this line is our console and it's shown in light green here, indicating that it's ours. And here we can change what those ports on the back do. So if I did wanna change that, that um, seventh port on the back, which is the XLR in port, I can just click on the XLR in and assign it as an out. And then say that, okay, I want it to output universe uh, 200. Okay, and we can do that. Um, these are all assignable, all of these, uh, all these cells within the network configuration page. So we can output DMX through those ports, but in this instance and in a lot of instances, you'll be using network protocols. And in order to output like either ArtNet or scanning ACN or Pathport, a net, I think that's what it's called, what's it called? Um, network protocols, yeah, pathport. Um, if you want to outport, output over any of these, we need to create a session first. And a session can just be uh, one console. You don't have to have anything else in your session, but in order to output through that ethernet port on the back um, and outport, output to like nodes or any other uh, kind of output device, you need to create a session. And we'll do that by going again, set up, MA network control. And we can see we have no sessions, not connected, no session ID, but we have two stations. We've got this computer and then my laptop over there that's running the capture visualization. So uh, we can create a session by, uh, you can just create a session name, be like, okay, this is MA crash course. And session ID would be one. Uh, I think you can have up to three sessions on a network. Don't quote me on that. You'll have to watch one of Will Murphy's ACT videos on that. <laughs> uh, we can see our station IP and the host name and station priority. Don't worry too much about that. Right now we just wanna create a session. And it's created just like that. Um, and now we can see up in the tab here, we are the master in the session. That is important because only the master in the session can output those network protocols. If you're connected with MANET, any station can output 
any of the universes on the MA net, but only the master will output those protocols like ArtNet or scanning ACN out of the back of the console. So we can see here, we've got uh, our console connected. Let's see if we've also connected our on PC. I wanna invite, actually I'm gonna go over to, uh, over to my PC and add it to the session here. So now we have two stations in our MA network. Uh, and we can see here we've got this console and we've got the computer over there running capture to visualize this. We can also see here that our link speed is fast. That means everything within that session is running on uh, gigabit speeds. And you can see that link speed 1000. Uh, there's nothing bad about using a 100 meg connection uh, unless you're using like a really complex show file and doing a lot of data back and forth then it can get a little bit sluggish but um, gigabit on everything is pretty cheap to do right now and you should be running gigabit regardless anyways now that we have master we have a little blue heart um, and you'll see that on the console and then on the on pc that i'm recording the screens with um, you will see a green heart that means that it's connected not master though so from here, we can go back into setup network protocols. And from here, we can turn on ArtNet output. We can see each line here is a different section of ArtNet. Um, you can pretty much, pretty much count on the fact that this is always going to work. Uh, anytime you're having any sort of ArtNet connection issues, uh, you should really be troubleshooting on the node side of things because if your IP and your subnet is set correctly on the desk and your outnet, artnet output is active and you've got this green network protocols thing going on, then 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, any sort of artnet problems are not on the console side. So we've got our fixtures patched and we're outputting DMX, whether it's through the, the ports on the back of the console or using an ethernet protocol. Um, what, do we, what do we do now? Um, if you've patched everything correctly and um, all of your settings for the output are correct, all lights are plugged in, you should see them home into their what's called the default position. And the default position is um, the values that all of the lights will go to. Uh, it's, what the, it's the value that the desk will send when there are no playbacks running, uh, the DMX tester is empty, and you have nothing in the programmer. So if everything is off on the desk, uh, there's nothing in the programmer, and the DMX tester is <laughs> off or n released, I guess is a better way to put it, and you have no like weird ArtNet merging going on, that is the value that the lights will go to. Um, so with that said, let's start building our programming view. And uh, we can do this by starting with our command screen. My, my favorite thing that I wanna usually put here is a smart window. So if I tap in the upper left-hand corner, uh, that'll populate a create basic window dialog. And from here, I can go to other, and uh, each one of these tabs has different types of windows, and you'll get used to where everything is uh, in due time. But right now, if you're a brand new programmer, the smart window is going to be your best friend. Um, your second best friend is going to be a command line feedback window. So once we've done our smart window, I'm going to create a command line feedback window. So we will go to, and the reason why I'm tapping here is because if I were to tap in the upper left-hand corner of the screen and do uh, command line feedback, it's gonna take up the whole screen and then I would have to resize it and move it down uh, and do all that extra work when I could just say, okay, I know that I want it to occupy like this section of the screen. So I'm gonna tap in the upper left-hand corner of where I want it and do command line. This is important because you don't wanna always be clicking the yellow ball and opening up the screen to see what the desk is thinking and doing. Um, and this will help you learn, again, how everything interacts with one another. 
next, uh, okay, so the next order of importance is going to be some sort of sheet. So I would say you want to use uh, a fixture seat, fixture sheet, and I'll drag that up here, resize it, and we can change it to programmer only. And that'll show you the values that you're actually putting into your lights in the programmer before you're storing them. Um, and then let's think here, what do I want to do in, uh, maybe we'll just do a clock, something like that, uh, because we know you're up against the clock at this point in your life and everybody loves clocks in MA. That's just how it is. Now on our screen two here, I'm going to start by putting in some presets here, some preset pool items. So we'll go to presets and I'm going to go to beam and I'm going to make a couple of different windows here. Um, I'm making them horizontally. Some people do vertically. Um, it's just, it really comes down to your personal choice. Whoops. And then just resizing as we go here. And then we'll do a couple positions. I'll do like an all presets. And then I'll go over to pools and we will create a groups window. So now I kind of have a basic layout to begin programming. So I'm gonna hit store, I'm gonna hit view button 1.1 and I'm gonna label this as programming. So now even if I were to clear out our screens either accidentally or on purpose, which you can clear the screens by holding down, um, this is called, uh, colloquial, colloquially, it is called the nipple button, um, but I believe it's also called the like uh, dialogue button, something like that. Anyways, if you hold this down and hit clear all screens, it'll reset your screens. But if you call our view button, ah, this is a great example to show you where I made a small mistake. When I stored this view, I only stored it as this screen, but I meant to store it as all three screens. We can use the oops key to go back to where we stored, to the moment before we stored. And now I can go and do this again and select, okay, I want screens one, two, and three to be stored in this view button, and I'll name it programming. So now, if I do that again, clear all screens, and I hit programming, it's gonna populate our screens with that view that is stored. Okay, great, but uh, okay, how do I start like manipulating fixtures? This is all just a bunch of layout stuff so far, right? Well, let's go back into our setup menu and go to a wonderful window called auto create or a page called auto create. So within here, we can create automatically groups based off of their like index number. So we can see here, we can choose fixture type or we can choose layer. We can choose yeah, either layer or fixture type. So I'm going to go to choose layer and I'm gonna just highlight all of our layers. I'm gonna hit create all. Okay, created seven groups, but where are they? Well, they're all in that first open slot in that group window we created. So now, I don't know if you can see that on our, uh, I'm gonna pull back here with my 3D mouse. Our house lights, we can highlight them. Check our Lico's. Okay, they highlight appropriately. Our vipers, hey, they're on too. The pointies, cool. The washes, I can't quite see them, so let's see if I can tilt them towards us. Okay, yeah, I can see those. 
cool. And I did that by just tapping on the group and we can see in our programming, uh, or excuse me, our, uh, our, our program only fixture sheet, we can see they're all selected and they're um, in, in like bold yellow. Uh, and then I can select position and just tilt them towards us just to verify, okay, they're working. Test our atomics. Okay, they all flash. Our color forces, they all come on. Wonderful. Okay, we're off to a great start. Let's uh, see what else we can auto create because that was pretty useful. Let's auto create some worlds. I'm gonna highlight here and I'm going to start at world two because world one is the default world. It's like the, the world that encompasses everything. And don't worry too much about what a world right now is. Just think of it as a restriction to what you can access. So if I were to go into world two and world two only has the house lights in it, then as long as I'm in world two, I can't modify, I can't do anything with the data of anything outside of world two. So it, it's, a, it's a really useful tool for programming and I'll show you why even at like the base level of learning MA, you should be learning, you should be using worlds. So create all of our worlds, created seven worlds. Now here's the fun part. Let's create some additional presets. I'm going to go to all of our layers or all of our fixture types that have uh, color as a, a preset type. Um, I can do this by either highlighting full sections or holding down control on our built-in keyboard and highlighting just the things that I want to have color presets. And let's see, do amount saturation, we just want one. Hues, we'll sort by hue. And then I will go add global mix color. Ah, but I messed up because I want to do merge global mix color. So create additional presets. Let's go merge global mix color. So if you hit add, it makes individual presets for each individual type. But if you go merge, it'll merge them all into one preset type. Let's do one more thing here uh, before we jump out of the auto create page. Let's go to our S4 Lico and our channel pages. And let's make sure all of our source four Lico's are highlighted and start at page one, start at fader one, and we'll just create six channels of channel faders. Let me show you what that is real quick. If I exit out of auto create, we can see uh, we've got all of our color presets here, global color presets. I'll explain what global means in a minute. And we don't see anything on our faders here. We just created six channel faders, but we don't see them. We only see them if we switch over to channel fader mode by hitting either up or down on our channel page minus or plus. Okay, you can also do this by just typing in, let's see if I were to like go back to a fader page by clicking fader page. If I were just to type channel page one, that brings us back to our channel faders. Now what is, what is, cha what is a channel fader versus a regular fader? Well, this is a way of programming. Uh, the channel faders are a way of setting values to the lights. Um, this is very common in like, um, uh, what do I want to say, corporate events or things where you want to be doing like fine tuning on multiple lights at once. And it's easier than like selecting on a layout view and then like rolling the dimmer wheel. You can just instead grab different lights and make little adjustments to the look of the stage overall. And you can see those red numbers with the red background are corresponding with our dimmer uh, attribute levels here. So all these little changes that you can make, these are all saved 
in the programmer and waiting for you to store them to an executor. Okay, so that's one way of adjusting values is assigning channels or assigning fixtures to channel faders. And then you can make all of your adjustments with your hands on the faders here. This is really useful for like theater and corporate events like I mentioned, TV, anything video related. Um, if you're recording anything, then this is gonna be your best friend for, pro for programming. Um, let's clear that out. When we clear that out, those values go back to zero. They go back to their default values because nothing is being played back right now. And we'll jump back over to our fader pages for now. I'm not really gonna use that channel page thing, but I wanted to show you that that's one way that you can change values to store later. Okay, let's move on and uh, start programming a little bit here. So uh, I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly uh, in a way that I would do it if I was actually in a time crunch for things right now. So I'm gonna first go through and make sure that all of our lights are in the correct position and correct orientation, okay? Um, so I can do this by selecting a fixture and highlighting through. And we can see, okay, everything is seeming to go from stage right to stage left. That makes sense. Let's do that with our vipers. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Cool, everything is in order. Pointies one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, all twelve of those are in order. Wonderful. Now we get to our quantum washes. Uh, let's just tilt them towards us again because that was a little easier. And if we want to get really sneaky about this, let's store this position where they're tilted down as our default preset. Um, a default preset will override or it basically rewrites the default values on a per fixture base basis. So those default values I was talking about before, those, uh, those can be kind of overwritten by creating a default preset. So I've put a position into the programmer. Highlight does not count as like adding values. It's just a temporary output of highlight values, which are assigned in the um, fixture type window. So if I go back over here, go to fixture types, edit our quantum, you can see there's a, there's a column in here called highlight. And highlight will temporarily output those values instead of what it would be outputting normally. It just basically overrides everything. Uh, even group masters <laughs> found that one out, interestingly enough. Um, it overrides everything, it overrides the grandmaster, it's uh, pretty sure. No, it does not override the Grandmaster, but it does override Group Masters, strangely enough. Um, so yeah, in here you can edit all of your defaults, but you can also do this easily by creating a default preset. So I'm also going to zoom in, we'll go to there, and then make our default preset straight out like that. So I just stored a preset by adjusting values in the programmer, hitting store, and then clicking on icon, or excuse me, clicking on, <laughs> I don't know why I called it an icon. It is a pool item and it is a preset. Okay, so a, a pool item, a preset can be a pool item. <laughs> there are all, all sorts of pool items, right? So everything that you see with this like tile arrangement, those are all pool items and presets are a type of pool item. And this happens to be an all preset, which means I can store any attribute to it. If I were to just store that to my position preset, then it wouldn't store the, uh, the zoom value that I added in there. I wanted to store the zoom value in there and the preset or and the position, so I stored it as an all preset. But our lights are still facing here. The values haven't gone anywhere as far as our output is concerned. Um, because we still have them in the programmer. They haven't been removed from the programmer yet. It's not like it got sucked into the preset. They exist in both places right now. But you can see our little position red dot and our red values over in our programming sheet 
are no longer a red background. So only things with a red background will get stored. So if I were to now change the color, let's say, and put the dimmer in, we have the dimmer and color with red backgrounds, but our focus and our position don't have red backgrounds. So if I were then to store this as, um, if I were to then store this as a fader and then turn it on, you can see we have the lights pointing straight up and in blue and on. So if I hit assign, I click on the preset that I want to make an all or that I want to make a default preset and hit enter. I can then change what's called the special mode. I'm going to change this to default. But I haven't it hasn't done anything yet. It's assigned as a default preset, but it will not write those preset or it will not write those default values to the fixtures in the patch until I double click or call it. So anytime you're um, anytime you click on an item, it selects the fixtures in that item first. It's called cell fix. You can see it in the command line feedback here. If I clear out again and I just tap the icon once, it says cell fix for select fixture preset 0 0.1. So the MA has called into the programmer all of the fixtures that are in preset one. Now it will not write those values or call those values until I tap it again. And now if I exit out, we have new default values. So I'm just gonna call this default preset home. And now, that fader that we wrote earlier, even though it only has dimmer and color information in it, since our preset for the default, the new defaults was called, that's our new default. Are you with me so far? I hope all of this is, is making a little bit of sense. Uh, let's move on to instances for a second. The reason why I want to talk the reason why I want to talk about instances is because it's maybe the most confusing part to new programmers. If I grab all of my quantum washes again, we can see that our sheet here is showing a whole lot more <laughs> than just the six fixtures that we patched. And that's because each fixture each of those quantum washes has five fixtures embedded within it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, and I'm going to use a, a fun tool, and I have, I have macros for this in my main show, but I'm gonna show you how to do this manually first. Since we imported and we auto-created these groups, they're imported in like index order, which is the first fixture and all of its instances, the second fixture and all of its instances, so on and so forth. And if you import by fixture, if you store by fixture type, you can go into a matrix and type in an interleave of the number of instances you have. If you can't remember, you can always go back into the setup window, go to patch only fixture types. And we can see here our quantum wash has five instances. Okay. Um, you could also take a look at your handy dandy fixture sheet that we've created over here and you can see, okay, 301, okay, it stops at 301.5 and then restarts at 302.1. So that means we've got five instances. So I'm going to type in an interleave of five. I'm just gonna hit next. And now we can see in our fixture sheet, only the first instances, the first instance of every five instances is now selected, okay? So I'm gonna create a new group right below, and I'm gonna continue making groups by hitting next and store until we get to that fifth one. Now I can call this first instance, since we have all of our first instance selects select here. Um, actually, let me show you another way to do this, because that's, that's the way you can do it via matrix, but if you wanna select 
a certain instance from an entire group. Say I want to select only instance one. Boom, I select group five, which selects all the instances of our quantum washes. Now, if I type in, and this is like a little bit more of an advanced feature, but I think you'll really like this. If I type in if fixture, if I spell fixture correctly, geez, fixture, and then I use an asterisk, right? Shift eight gives us an asterisk, which serves as a wild card. So think of an asterisk as telling the MA uh, this asterisk can be any number or it can be any letter. <laughs> it's, any, it's any character in the whole system. Dot, remember dot determines which instance we're talking about, dot one. Okay, isn't that cool? I just said if fixture wildcard dot one and it selects it restricts our selection to only instance one of all of those fixtures in that group, which is the same, it's the same thing as doing the MA tricks, but if you're ever in a more complex situation, that can be really helpful. So now I'm just gonna go through and rename these groups, QWASH main, RGB1, RGB2, RGB3, and then Aura, because that's the layout of the channel, or that's the layout of the instances. So I've just created smaller groups from our main quantum group, and it just makes things a whole lot easier. Okay. Um, since I made this one little sequence just as kind of a demo sequence, uh, I'll show you something cool about this. If I delete the sequence, the output stops, and there's no more fader where it was, but I've only deleted the executor, the physical thing, the physical handle that I'm using to control that sequence. If I wanted to reassign that sequence, we could just go into the sequence pool and assign it from the sequence pool. So I'm going to encoder button or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and I'm going to create a sequences pool. So again, basic window, click here, sequence. Hey, there's our sequence that we stored earlier. This brings up an awesome topic about how the MA organizes your data in the background even though you're not really even thinking about it. Um, even if I were to just say, okay, I'm gonna grab all my Vipers at full, store, store to Q1. Okay, I've stored the fader, but I've also populated a sequence automatically in the sequence pool. So it's saving me a step by storing directly to a fader. It will store also that sequence as a new sequence in the first available sequence. Okay, and again, if I were to delete that, it's no longer on our faders here, but it's still in our sequence pool, not labeled as anything. So I'm going to label sequence two. You can do this completely through the command line. You don't have to touch anything on the screen. I'll show you. If I do assign assign, that gives us the label keyword. And then I just type sequence two, please. It's gonna give me a pop-up and says, okay, what do you wanna name sequence two? Well, I'm just gonna name it Viper Dim. Okay, cool. Now, what if I want to have that sequence controllable through an executor? Because I got nothing on the executors right now. Okay, let's do it through the command line again. Assign sequence two. And I think I can do this without saying at executor one dot one. Cool. So now I've assigned that sequence and its contents to an executor. Pretty sweet. I can do the same thing by clicking assign, clicking the sequence, and then tapping a key. So now we've got our vipers and our quantum washes and the values that are stored in there being controlled from physical executors. So all the buttons are called executors. 
um, the faders have three buttons associated with them. So this first fader has one, two, three buttons. Uh, this whole row below here, they're just buttons. They can only do one action at a time. So I'm gonna assign the second one as uh, Aura, or sorry, Quantum Wash, Q Wash Dim. But if you remember, in this Q Wash, we had stored, let's do uh, Fixture Sort. If you recall, uh, we stored a value of blue of some sort. Speaking of which, let's go through and rename these. Instead of their hue values, red, orange, yellow, lime, green. <laughs> this is the more tedious part. C, C, cyan, blue, indigo, violet, magenta, pink. Okay, there's our like 13 basic colors that are auto-created in MA. So we stored blue to here, to this uh, Q quantum wash sequence, right? Maybe I kind of changed my mind. I'm like, okay, I don't really, it doesn't make sense for me to put blue in where the dimmer fader is, okay? I wanna do that separately maybe later some other way. Really easy to get rid of it. So I can just select quantum wash again. I can go to color and I can just tap on the preset type again. Remember our red background means that uh, those are now active values. And I'm going to hold down store, hit remove. And now the store mode, since it's changed to remove, it's going to take any active values. And if they existed previously in whatever button I press now, because we're we're in store mode, but whatever I press next is going to store to there. But I'm kind of doing the reverse of storing. I'm removing, right? Because I've changed the, the, the mode from overwrite or merge, whatever, to remove. So if I click here, okay, and I clear out, we no longer have dimmer, or we no longer have color associated or stored into this sequence. So now we've got dimmer, only here. Now you notice we got a big fader moving in addition to our fader number one. Now why is that? You may notice that that one fader has something different about it than all the other faders and that it has a green title bar, okay? That is because it is what is called the selected executor. Um, you can select multiple executors, but there's only one like first selected executor. And that first selected executor is controlled by what's called these default go buttons. These are like big go, big go minus, and big pause. There's also a small go minus, a small pause, and a small go plus. These are different buttons. These are not the same in any way. Um, these are actions that can be applied to any other like pool object, but these, the big ones, will only ever apply to the selected executors. Now, right now I only have one selected executor, but if I were to hold down select, tap one and two, and hit go on both of them, they both have a blue background now, which means that they are on, okay? Um, now you see when I fade up and then fade down, the blue background changes. The reason for that is these faders are assigned as auto start and auto stop. So if I hit assign, click an executor, we have a window that pops up for all of our options for just that one executor, which is pretty crazy to think about. And these options change the way it interacts with the rest of the show file. So I was saying that auto start and auto stop were enabled. So if I turn those off for both of these, 
Now, you'll notice we have no more output. Our faders are moving, but the lights aren't coming on. They're not dimming up. And the reason is there are two different distinct uh, actions that need to happen for um, dimmers to react in a, in a, in a executor. The first, of that, the first of those things is that you need to have a level. So right now they're at zero. So even if they were turned on, the level is still at zero. But if I bring them up, you'll notice that we have little indicators where the faders are assigned to. It says LTP value of uh, 36 on each of these at 36%. Our, the reason our lights aren't on is because the sequence isn't on on the executor. The value, the level is set, but the actual sequence itself is not on. So I can do that hitting on and clicking on an executor. We can change that assignment to kind of do that on our behalf. Now there are reasons why you would want auto start and auto stop on for different situations. But for now, you're probably gonna want auto stop and auto start on. I'm just informing you that that's how that happens, uh, why that might be useful. But we've got a few other things that we can do with these two faders that we've stored now, okay? Um, we could change the buttons so that instead of acting as a go, you can see that they're assigned as go on button one. We could change the assignment by going to function Clicking on our like, you know, this is a virtual arrangement. You can see our fader in the middle and then our buttons one, two, and three. We change button three to flash. Change uh, the function of button one to, I like top. Uh, top brings you to the top of a queue list. So if you have multiple queues stored in that sequence, if you hit top, it'll always just go to the first queue. And then go as button two. So go will go forward with fade times through different cues, right? So for example, right now we've just been working with one cue and now we have a flash button assigned to button one. I'm just gonna do the same real quickly to this guy. And I'm also gonna save this as a sequence default assignment. So now any other sequences I store will have that same fader and button arrangement. So let's go back to just selecting our one executor. Now we just have Viper Dim selected. What if I wanted to have it so that fader or Q1 controlled all of the intensity of all of the Vipers? And I wanted like a second queue where only the back ones came on and then a third queue where only the front ones came on and I could go between those queues, okay? Well, let's figure out how to do that. Now, I could start typing in the numbers of all of these, uh, all these different, let me just say, get a little bit closer. 3D space mouse. <laughs> 3D connection space mouse for the win. Um, okay, so we're a little closer to the stage. Uh, what if I wanna like easily grab, say, the, the first four vipers or the middle two vipers. Okay, right now it's not really that convenient because all we have is full groups, okay? We just have full groups of fixtures and we have no real like granular way of selecting it. This is where the most important feature of any, like any programming comes into play and that is layout views. Love layout views. I'm gonna store this as just a solo view as sheets or sheet. And then I'm going to do nipple button, clear screen, just this screen. And I'm going to go to other, create a layout view. And I'm gonna shrink it by just one, one like J bracket or L if you're looking from that direction. And I'm going to go into this column, create a groups pool. I'm going to go down here and create a worlds pool. I haven't forgotten about worlds yet. You thought I forgot? Okay, not quite yet. <clears throat> and I'm gonna store this view as a layout view. So we've got our sheet view, our layout view. 
And oh, I'm actually going to change this. I'm going to change this group pool to a layout pool. And if you ever make any changes like that, remember, if you are to click on this view, it's going to go back to group. Okay. So I'm just going to go back one action. And I'm going to store that view again. So now I can toggle back and forth between sheet and layout view. And I am going to now create a 2D representation of our 3D stage. Because remember, we don't really, we're just walking into this, right? We don't have any like paperwork or plots or 3D or anything to really help us. But we do have all of our fixtures stored into groups. I can dump those into a layout view and arrange them in a layout view in a way that makes it easy to select everything. So I'm going to select all the things I want in a top-down view. So it'd be my Lycos, Vipers, Pointies, Quantum Washes, Atomics, and CF-72s. I'm gonna store those to layout. I'm just gonna call this top. I'm gonna call it top 2D, make it easy to understand. And now, this is the fun part. <laughs> I'm going to do setup and setup will automatically change my encoder view to something a little bit different. It's going to change it to allow us to edit the properties of the layout view. So I've got all of my lights selected. I want to arrange them by camera. And then we're going to do top view 2D. Boom. Now I'm going to unclick setup, zoom to fit. All of our fixtures are now stored at like the zero, zero, zero X, Y, Z point in the 3D like uh, stage view. Because when we imported them and we made layers for them, it was automatically assigned an X, Y, Z value of zero, zero, zero. If we had a stage view <laughs> or a capture file that was exported with 3D positions like I have in my other video, you can click in the corner up there, um, then we could automate this process a little easier. But since we don't have that, and we're going on well over an hour and 15 minutes now of this video, um, I'm just gonna show you this way of doing it. So we have all of our fixtures kind of laying over top of each other in this um, 2D plane from the top. And from looking at the stage, I can say, okay, well, I know that um, our vipers exist in two trusses. So let's start by building a layout for the first four vipers. So we got one, two, three, four. Okay. So let's just move those by clicking setup, going to element properties. Let's just move them up. And I'm just going to arrange them loosely where they are. So there's one, oops, let's go back. I'm gonna undo that. I'm gonna select all vipers, move all of them up. And then I'm gonna select fixture 101 through 104. Try that again. Fixture 101 through 104. Now we can move that to our upstage truss and I'm going to arrange them in a line. A line that is, you know, pretty close to what I see on stage, hit apply. Now we'll go fixture 105 through 108. Element properties, arrange by line. Close enough. We don't have to be like scientific about this. Now we've got our pointies. Do the same thing, element properties. Let's move it up a little bit. And then we can see we've got uh, six fixtures on each truss and I know they're 201 through 2, 
06 from our patch that we got earlier. I'm gonna move them all up onto the upstage cord of our invisible truss on our 2D uh, layout view here. We'll do arrange by line. And apply. Again, you don't have to be perfect about this. I'll show you why in a second. Fixture 107 through 112. Whoops, 207 through 112. For, through 212. <laughs> oh, fun times. Go onto this truss, arrange by line. And apply. That looks pretty close. Now, here's a cool thing. If I grab all these fixtures, even though they're spaced oddly, and I just hit arrange by line, it'll automatically space them. Line, apply. It'll automatically space them. <laughs> I love, that's like one of my favorite little tricks is the align, or the uh, arrange by line trick to line up things. Amazing. Okay, next we have our Color Force 72s in the back. Now I know these are grouped by blocks of 12. So I'm going to first move them up stage. And then I'm going to go to M matrix blocks of 12. move. So that first one I know is over there. Next one's going to be right next to it. Third one. Just confirming on the screen that we have the right positions. Oh, oh my goodness, guys, what has happened? Look at our 3D versus our 2D. The last two are backwards. <laughs> oh, oh man, what a mistake. Who could have possibly made this mistake? Okay, I actually did this on purpose and I'm gonna show you why. So if I were to next through here, and we can't, I can't really see, let me see if I can get my space mouse in here a little. Come on. Okay, 3D Space Mouse is not too happy right now. Anyways, if I am nexting through, I've, I've purposefully made it so that the last two are flip-flopped in here. So in our imaginary stage, the last two color forces got flipped. Okay, 507 and 508, in reality on our stage, someone put them backwards. Let's say that, okay, we don't have any more people to help us go change the addresses on the fixtures or physically swap the units. We can do this on the console side, relatively easy. So we need to swap 507 and 508. So we'll go back into the patch. We can go into patch live, CF72 layer, And I'm just going to highlight the last two, starting from the bottom. And I'm going to type in the address of the first one. So 1.217. We're going to get an error, patch collision error, but hit OK. And now the addresses of those two bars are swapped. So now oh, if I hit select, I highlight, and I next through. They now go in order properly. Sweet. Okay, so we got those color forces laid out. Now here is an interesting one. Back to our instances on our quantum washes. We know there's five instances. So I'm going to make sure I select all of them, move them up into position along the upstage edge of our deck. And I'm going to, again, arrange by first going to M matrix and doing blocks of five and then manually spacing them evenly 
along the upstage. Just like that. Again, precision isn't like super critical on this, but if you want to just go back and make a few adjustments. There you go. Easy peasy. What else do we have left? We've got our Source 4 Lecos. <laughs> I know they're not called Source 4 Lecos actually, but it's fun to trigger people. First one is on far stage right. Let's pop him here. Just kind of continue filling in the gaps. And then lastly, we have our atomics. And they're kind of hard to see with the default values. So I'm gonna go in and switch to our beam preset type click on strobe duration, go max duration, shutter, max strobe. And it looks like that might be a default value that I can change. Okay. So now we can see, if I zoom out here, Use our Grandmaster. Okay, well, we only have three visible. This is another, another thing I've formulated to kind of show you guys how you can troubleshoot some issues like this. So first I'm going to lay them out how they should be on our plot. So it should be 401, 402, 403, 404. We can use our line arrangement to do that. Apply. So let's highlight. Okay, we've got our first one. That's reacting correctly according to our layout. Number two is not coming on. 402 is not coming on. Interesting. And number three is coming on and four is coming on. So our address is wrong on 402, but our truss is already flown in the air and atomics use dip switches, right? So how could we possibly figure out what the address is set to? Let's say we can't get up there and change it. Well, I'm gonna use a awesome tool right after I <laughs> save my show file and turn on auto save for 15 minutes. <laughs> We've gone this whole time without saving, big no, no. Um, you can also command line save by saying save, save show or just save SA. Yeah, SA. <laughs> Anyways, how can we figure out what address that atomic is set to? Well, we know for a fact that the first channel, if it's set, well, in either mode four, mode four channel or mode one channel, that the first channel is going to send a shutter value to 100, okay? How can we send raw DMX values without patching a fixture? We can do that by going into the DMX tester which you get to by hitting channel, channel. And it pops up here. We know for a fact that it's in line with those other fixtures on that universe, which is universe number three. So we can go to universe three and we can send a test output signal. I'm gonna send a test output of 255 to address one. Now, if we start scrolling through that universe, we will see different values pop up, okay? So if I just continue scrolling through here, you can see, okay, there's our pointies. They're one by one coming on. Oh, wait, so we got strobes coming on. So I see that number one, 401 flashed and it's at address 281. Okay, that means that four addresses later, our next fixture should come on, 402. So we'll, two, three, four, but it doesn't come on. It should be coming on at address 285. We'll continue. Okay, there's our third one and our fourth one. Hmm. So obviously we know our address isn't set correctly, but maybe we can figure out what the address of that atomic is. 
So just keep on scrolling and we're just waiting to see some sort of flash from that atomic on the screen or in real life. So just keep on scrolling. I'm not seeing any flashing yet. We're getting towards the end of the universe. Losing hope, losing hope. Oh, whoa, what was that? Did you see that? <laughs> oh my goodness. So when we get to address 420, flashes. Okay, so what if we change our address to 420? So we'll release everything from the DMX tester. Okay, we're, we're good on that. We'll go back into our atomic addresses and we'll say, okay, that's actually universe three dot address 420. All right, let's see if that worked. Can we select it and highlight it? Hey, look at that. <laughs> So our paperwork was wrong and I, I, uh, I set that up. That was another, another trick that I just wanted to show you. Um, if you run into an issue like that, you can, you can determine the actual address of fixtures using the DMX tester, do all sorts of other fun stuff. Okay, now that we have a 2D top layout view, let's talk a little bit about those worlds I was so adamant about. Uh, we've got our worlds stored down here from our auto create earlier. And we can use this as a access filter. What do I mean by access filter? It restricts what we can modify with the programmer. It doesn't change your playback at all. So even though I'm in Viper world, I can still play back the quantum wash executors, right? Um, and the full world, world number one, you can't delete it. You can't do anything with it really. It just exists as like a uh, default, right? You can't modify it, but you can store other worlds. And one important thing to remember is if you enter a world and you like, you know, can make some adjustments, say, okay, these lights need to go this position and uh, you store that, whatever and you clear out. If you then start programming again, you won't be able to access anything until you go back into world one. You won't be able to access anything outside of that. Um, just an important thing to remember. Okay. Wow, we're getting pretty long in this video. Sorry about that. Um, again, appreciate you watching. And if you're enjoying the video, um, like, favorite, share, subscribe. <laughs> Check me out on Patreon. Uh, got a lot of videos. Uh, not quite like this. This is a little more long format. But uh, hope it's been useful and enjoyable. Anyways, on to the rest of the video. Um, let's talk a little bit about those quantum washes, because if I were to enter quantum wash world, I still have all of the instances mixed in with it. Okay. Maybe I want to be a little more restrictive. Maybe I want to just change, uh, store a world that is just the quantum wash main instance world, which has just the pan and the tilt and the dimmer. Right. And then I want another world that is just the RGB values, okay? And then I'll call that QWash RGB. Okay, now I can turn up the dimmer value and program using presets, right? That's a lot easier. Um, And then let's go one step further. I actually want to get rid of the aura, the background aura from the, uh, from the layout that I started. So I'll go back into the full world, got the aura. I can do this a couple ways. I could just remove them. I just hit like store remove, but I'll show you another way here that's sometimes helpful. Click the title bar to get our element properties. I'm just going to move them out of the way and hit delete and boop, select them. Now they're no longer in here. The aura background for the quantum washes doesn't exist anymore. And I want to make it so that this Q wash dimmer that I've stored only affects the main instance. Does that make sense? So I'm going to highlight um, and I'm going to go back into world one and I'm going to hit full store 
click the executor, hit overwrite. So now we have just the main instance with a dimmer on it. So why aren't we seeing any color? It's because the defaults of the R, G, and B cells are zero. Now, how can I change the defaults, right? We can either go into setup or I can just create a 100 value open to our default preset. And now those RGB cells will come on, will stay on at 100%, and I can modify their color values with the presets. Cool. We're getting there. So we've got our layout view, everything's set. Let's create a couple of faders more for our different fixture types. Select all of our color forces. We can either select them in the layout view or hit group, full, clear out, label, CF72, dim. Cool, we got that. We've got our quantum wash. We've got our vipers. We're missing our pointies. Pointies, full, pointy, dim. Got those. And I also want those to default at the ultra narrow zoom. Store, back to our default. Call the default. Now, even though we only have dimmer stored here, we can see that it is in ultra narrow. All right, let's create a, uh, a DJ Lico look. Okay, so let's go into our Lico world. And let's find two that are focused mainly on the DJ. So that one's good and that one's good. So we've got like an, a wide and then a tight DJ look. So let's create a two Q sequence starting with first full intensity tight in on the DJ. And now I'm going to bring those values to zero. You can either do this by using the dimmer wheel or if you hit dot dot, it takes them to zero. And I'm going to go to our outside Lico's, hit them at full. So that'll be like the outside wider look. Store, click our sequence we're working on, click our executor for the sequence we're working on. Create second queue. Okay. Now what if we want one that has both Okay, I haven't touched the values on the ones that are still on, and those values will track through to the next queue. Tracking is like layers of transparency, where only what you change changes. So if I don't touch the values of those other Lico's, they're gonna stay on, because they're on right now in this queue. So now I've got a both. Now I want all the lights that are on in the next queue to go off. I can select those fixtures by hitting our if key, if output, take them to zero, grab our kind of like, this is like our, uh, I call this like the uh, family photo light look, right? And then create that queue. And then finally, we'll do one where they are all on. So right now we've got five cues. If we turn it on, there's our first cue. We can then, I'll select this, it's a little easier to see. We can then go to our second cue, which is the outside. Both, just the little center stage wash, and then all. And then it cycles back. You can change whether or not it cycles back, again, in that assign options menu. Restart first, wrap around allows it to go back to Q1. I want that on for this Q. Okay, so let's say I want to have a little bit of a fade so it's not so sharp between those looks. Hit edit, click on our sequence, and we can start by like naming like DJ tight. DJ wide, 
both stage and all. And we can change the fade time of all of those cues to like two seconds, okay? And that'll mean that it won't be such a harsh like on off type deal. You can fade between those values and you can see that changing on our layout view. Okay, cool. And I'm gonna change that to DJ Keylight. And it'll always restart on the first cue because of that setting that I set. Go back into world one. Uh, we have not done anything with our house lights yet. Put our house lights on a totally separate fader. House lights. Okay, those are over here now. Last but not least, our atomics. I'm going to create two separate faders, one for the dimmer on all of them, and then uh, a dimmer for the shutter speed, right? How fast the strobe goes. So if we hit full, we've got atomics, atomic dim, and then I'm going to select the fixtures again, go to our beam preset type, and you can either scroll up on our shutter. I'm gonna go max strobe. I'm gonna store that to a beam preset. Store that as max shutter. I'm going to call that preset and store it right next to the dimmer. Now, so far we've only been working with dimmer levels in regards to the faders, right? So uh, dimmers are thought of a little bit differently than other values when it comes to fader assignments. So if I were to look at our atomics, you can see the fader isn't fading the shutter values. It's just, it's jumping directly to 100, okay? And that's because these LTP faders only fade the dimmer values. Since we don't have any dimmer values stored in here, it's just flipping on, see our blue background is going to 100%. If we want to fade the shutter value, we either need to use crossfade or my favorite, temp faders. So I'll hit assign, function, master, temp fader. So now, once we've assigned that fader as a temp fader, our shutter values are fading. Okay, so if we bring our atomics up, we can see that our strobe rate is getting faster and faster and this, the visualizer can't even keep up with it, it's so fast. So now we've separated out the intensity and the speed, the shutter speed. So we'll call that strobe speed. Cool. Go back into world one. And remember that smart window? <laughs> I apologize, I should have been talking a little bit more about it, but uh, let's, let's work a little bit on creating a, um, a playback window on our, our second page over here on our like uh, layout view. So I'm gonna create another page, playbacks, and we'll go action buttons. And I'm gonna make action buttons like this, and then let's make another playback page and change this fader assignment here. We'll go to channels never. Okay, uh, we'll call this page playback. And let's create a series of color looks for every fixture type, okay? So I'll start with the Vipers. If I turn them up on our playback here, the values don't go into the programmer, 
Okay, they're output on the stage, but they're not gonna be stored into anything that we do in the programmer. So I've got my Viper selected. We'll start off with white. Hit go, or hit store, and then click on an empty tile or empty executor. And I'm gonna do red, orange stored into a separate queue, and yellow into a third queue. Then I'm gonna do our greens. Then our blues. And then finally our magentas. So they're kind of stored into five different uh, genres of color. So I'm gonna just Mint label a little bit here. Um, reds, greens, blues, magentas. Now you notice all of these are set to uh, go by default and they're not playing back right now. We're just seeing the default values coming out of our vipers. Uh, speaking of vipers, let's move them. And I don't like the way they react. So if it's, it feels unnatural to you that the way you rotate the tilt encoder, what you can do is you can go into setup, go to our viper layer and tilt DMX invert. And now they're going the way that I feel is correct. Okay, let's just create this, this preset here, this position preset, we'll call it straight low. Now, you'll notice there's a difference here between our position preset that has an S on it for um, selective and G for global. Think of global as a preset that those exact values apply to all of that fixture type. So orange on this Viper is the exact same as orange on that Viper, so on and so forth. So global is for fixture types and then it applies for the other fixture types that are stored in there as well. But a selective preset means that each fixture has its own unique values stored into that preset that aren't the same, right? So if I, right now they're the same because I've pointed them all out, but if I were to say, okay, I want to uh, fan them out a little bit. So if I grab this upstage row and I hit align, 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 and fade them, or excuse me, and align them outwards and then do the same thing. These fixtures all have independent pan tilt values. And I can store those, say we'll fan out low. Each one of those values is unique to every individual fixture, but green is the same for all of them. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. So let's make a position stack. We'll start with straight low, go back to our playbacks, and I'm gonna create a positions executor with three, a width of three. I'm gonna label it as positions. And I'm gonna label this first queue as straight low. And I'm gonna turn it on, whoops, by hitting direct action. It's one tricky thing about starting a new show file is direct action means that it will become an action button for whatever that uh, executor label is. Store playback, cool. <clears throat> so now that position is outputting and I can create a second queue fan out low, create second queue. 
Now let's say I have like a variability of fade times that I can't really determine by just saying, okay, this is always going to be a fade time of one. Okay, how could I make it so that I could adjust it on the fly? Well, we could use what's called exec time. And you can see these two faders over here, program time and exec time. Um, if this fader is up and set time is off, it won't do anything. It, exec time will only work if that red dot is on, on exec time. And your executors are following exec time. So we'll go hit assign and we can see that ignore exec time is off, okay? So now if I take my exec time all the way up to 10 seconds, the fade between those two cues will take 10 seconds instead of the one that I had in the fade time. But we now have another kind of problem here. All of our other execs were set to not ignore the exec time as well. So I want to change that for all of my executors globally for the whole show file. <laughs> I would have done this sooner. This part is not, this is not actually uh, something I was planning on showing you, but we can assign executors. We can do this all through the command line. So I'll do assign exec dot slash ignore exec time equals on. So now they should all ignore it and they do. So what that command line did is it just went through and instead of me having to click assign, click here and then turn on ignore exec time, it did it to all of the sequences globally. I just realized I hit the mic really hard at that point, sorry. Um, I'm gonna save those as default options and now I can just go back and change that one to ignore exec time off. So now that one will follow, but the others won't. Cool. So now we're getting somewhere. Let's, uh, I'm gonna move these out of the way a little bit. Okay, and now we can bring our vipers up and go to our magenta color. And let's create a little sequence of different zoom values. So we'll go from narrow, and again, I'm creating, actually, let's just, let's just do this with smart because I told you guys to do it with smart. Uh, so we'll go smart, go wide, and now I can name these as narrow medium, wide, click narrow, move this guy out of the way. Wide. So now I can call this Viper Zoom. And we can go through those three different zoom levels. Now we're getting a show going. <laughs> I'm gonna rearrange these faders a little bit by hitting the move key. And let's create that position cue for these pointies. Oh, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh my goodness. My pointies are going the opposite direction. How can I possibly fix this? That doesn't make any sense. So, and this is, a, this is again, just a thing that I'm, I, I planted beforehand. Um, okay, so our downstage truss is correct and the upstage is incorrect. So what I can do, I can go into our pointy patch and I can invert the first six tilt. And now they work correctly again. 
Fantastic. So we we'll call this one straight low. I can store it into that same preset. And then I'm going to go to my pointy world, reselect, make sure we're in the right order here. And I'm going to change my align group to six. And now if I hit align three times, they will align in a group of six. Pretty cool, huh? Fan out low. Fantastic. Now, let's say for our LEDs, we wanna do something a little bit different. And let's say for the quantum washes, I want to be able to, um, I wanna be able to mix with the colors, with the faders. This is a, a request I get like a, a lot. Okay, so we'll grab all our RGB instances and we're going to create um, a red fader. But when we hit red, you notice that our green and blue also activated. I'm going to deactivate both red and blue and I'm going to store red to a fader. I'm going to do the same thing, deactivate everything except for green for the green fader. And then create an indigo, which is full just blue, and deactivate red and green. So now I'm gonna go back and change that assignment again to temp fader for all of these. Temp fader, temp fader, but we're not over yet, okay? <laughs> we need to change the default of the red, green, and blue to black, okay? So we'll go to color and we'll go to special dialogue and this will pop up our color picker, wonderful color picker. We can see all the beautiful colors of the rainbow here. You can even align along it, create like rainbows and stuff. But we want to do something a little more interesting than that. And that is store the default as black. I'm actually just going to store it black color preset. And I'm going to store it as the default. Whereas before it was a white default, now it's a black default and we can add in and color mix to our heart's content using the red, green, and blue faders for those quantum washes. Now let's go one step further. Let's give us the option to control which of those rings are on. So by default, all of them are set to on. So I'm going to create a dummy queue that has nothing in it, right? No, no, nothing active in the programmer. I'm just going to store and label this as quantum rings. I'm gonna make that a two wide. So now if I hit go, I'm in Q1 and it's just the default values. There's nothing there. I'll show you why I store Q1 like that. Now I'm going to turn off uh, instances two and three, create second queue. And now I can toggle back and forth between that inside ring and the full, full thing being shown. And we can control the color independently with the faders. So now I can either just hit go or top and I can switch between those two ring modes. And the dimmer still dims with everything else. Now let's create a button down below that just turns the shutter to max on all of our fixtures so we can like busk with it or something. So smart window, 
go to max strobe. Should just do that with all of these. Quantum wash, max strobe. I'm just gonna throw that to a button down here and assign it as temp. So I do assign temp button one. And I'm gonna label that as all strobe. So now that's just affecting the strobe values of the fixtures. So if they're not on, they're not gonna come on. But if I have our lights up, it's gonna strobe all of them. Okay. Let's create a set of zoom cues for our quantum washes. Again, we only need to select our main instance, because it's the only one that has zoom. We'll go to our focus. We'll go store a couple of these presets, normal, narrow, whoops. So now we can do the same thing as we did before, quantum rings. Okay. Let's work on throwing some gobos in our vipers. So we'll grab all of our vipers, go to gobo on our encoder bar. And we need to first create a gobo one focus, right? So this is just, we'll use this as a dummy focus for right now. Usually like around 25 is good. And I'm going to store that and I'm gonna call that G1 focus. Cause the, the gobo wheels exist on different planes in the optics. So you need to create a gobo one focus uh, preset. Go back to gobo. Uh, we'll go to open first for wheel one, store that. And then I'm just gonna go through and store a couple of my favorite gobos. Let's do like five. Okay. So we got those first ones stored and we can see they're a little bit out of focus. So how could we fix that? Well, let's go back over to our focus tab and let's adjust it until, okay, wow, that looks really sharp. Awesome. I'm gonna hit update instead of store. And now we can see in preset destinations, we have G1 focus because that preset was previously active in our programmer and we went and updated it. Uh, it wasn't active, excuse me, it was in our programmer. It wasn't active though. Um, we can now update that preset and now those values have been stored into G1 focus for us to use. So I'm going to create open gobo and normally you would have an open focus as well. So let's just create a BS one, call this open focus. And we'll store that as Q1 and then dots in space hit our G1 focus, create second queue. And now we don't have to hit G1 focus again because all the values track through the rest of those queues. So we just have to hit uh, next queue, store. Cool. So now it's super easy. We can hit our first queue, which is open. Second queue, which is our gobos, and then we can just click through them. Pretty cool. And then if we wanted to add a rotation into that, say maybe we throw rotation on a fader, we could go to gobo again, G1 rotate. And I'm going to actually change our default to the stop. So we'll do it again, Viper. That's really fast in one direction. Let's say 
we wanted the right side to go one direction and the left side to go another direction. We can go to our Viper world and go the other way. And store that to a fader. Now, if you want to be smart about this, you can call the values of a fader by hitting on, on, hitting call. And then we'll store that to rotation, to a, a Gobo preset called rotate. Rotate fast. We'll call that and store overwrite and label this as Gobo rotate. And of course, change the fader assignment to a temp. So now we have counter rotating gobos on a fader. And that'll maintain the rotation through all the other gobos. All right, we're getting there. Now we gotta do a big list of colors for our color forces. Let's do white, red, Okay, so now our color forces are in a big list. Sometimes I like doing it that way versus having uh, individual ones, but it's really up to your taste. CF72 colors, there we go. Now I know what you're saying, where are all of the movement effects? <laughs> Let's work on that. Let's create a second programming page. I'm gonna delete this. I'm gonna create a pool called effects, create a window called effects, and then we'll go and label that view as effects. Let's edit an empty tile, hit load predefined, and let's go to pan tilt circle. This is a template effect. It's a relative template effect, and you can tell that because it says RT in the corner. That means that there are no fixtures stored into this, and you have to first select fixtures before you can apply them to that template. Let me show you. Let's turn everything off except for, uh, let's do our pointies, and let's, uh, let's get them in that position. We'll go to our... Go pointies, fan out low, go to our playback, store Q to click positions. Now they're stuck there. <laughs> or at least they're positioned there right now. Let's go back to our layout view, go back to our effects view, go to pointy. Now let's just see what happens if I select these and I click pan tilt circle. Okay, well they're they're moving in <laughs> they're moving in an effect that's for sure, but uh, maybe you like that maybe that's what you want to go for or maybe you want to do like um, one of those symmetric effects. So let's hit edit and let's change the wings of the pan line to negative two and the tilt line to two. Okay, now we're getting somewhere a little closer but it still looks a little off to me, right? Like they're not like perfectly in sync. And the reason that is, is because I just made a pretty random selection of the lights before I selected the effect. Now keep in mind, effects are like a waveform, right? Like either a sine wave or a square wave or a saw wave. It's really just applying different values over time in a waveform, right? Um, so the way it spreads those values is based off of the selection order. So if I just grab these randomly, uh, there's no real, <laughs> there's no real art to it. It just kind of does an effect. But if I were to instead create a selection that kind of goes around 
the circle of everything, you can see, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Now we're getting somewhere where it looks a little bit more purposeful, okay? And that's all just because I made a thoughtful selection about the order starting from the center and kind of wrapping around. And I know that those values are gonna be distributed evenly across my selection. So let's store that circle to our beam row that I haven't really done anything with. Call that beam FX. Now if I hit go on here, it's gonna do that effect. <laughs> I'm gonna move them over a little bit. I can do the same thing with the spots. Let's go over to our Viper world. Pan tilt circle. Now they're circling as well. I can store that here, we'll call that Viper effects. And now they can both go. Now what if I wanted to temporarily stop the movement, or not stop the movement, but take the effect to zero, temporarily, of course. Well, um, I could create a temp fader that stomps the effect. Okay, so let's go programmer, grab all my moving lights, and I can even create another group that is just all moving lights, moving heads, MH. Grab that, position, switch to our effect layer, change it to stomp. Now let's create that as a fader and assign it as temp. And then the last thing I wanna do is change my Viper effects so that they are not off on overwritten. So now, when this fader is at 100%, it's stomping out our effects here. But if I were to hit go on beam effects again, even though this fader is up, because they are the same priority of normal LTP priority, they override each other, okay? So when one takes precedence over the previous one, those new values go forward. If I want this fader to never be overwritten, I need to change the fader to a higher priority. So hit assign and we'll go up one priority, call it a high priority. So now if that fader is up and I hit go on either of these, it doesn't matter because this fader is a higher priority, okay? Cool. So I'm gonna call that move size. So the further I move this up, it, stop, it stops the movement, okay? All right, what else can we do to wrap up this video? I've only got another 10 minutes <laughs> before I really have to go. I, I've been sitting here for way too long, way too long. I got a flight to catch in just a few hours here. So uh, we've got our quantum washes doing their thing. You can change their values RGB. Um, we've got our pointies doing the pointy thing. Let's talk about making selections over a whole group of things and make like a dimmer effect that affects all of our fixtures. Okay, how could we do this? Well, remember what I said about selection order. Let's go to our top view 2D and let's create a selection Oops. Also, if you make an incorrect selection in a layout view, if you just hit oops once, it'll undo that one selection. I'm gonna create that group as left, right. Left, right, all. Remember that if key we were using before? Let's say I wanna just have the color forces and the main instances of the quantum wash do like a left, right effect. So that I'm not getting any weird artifacts with the instances. I'm gonna select left, right, all. And if I highlight, you can see that's literally everything. And I wanna turn off RGBs. I wanna turn off the atomics. And I wanna turn off the Lycos. 
Now I can store that as a new group, call that left, right, dim, just so that I can keep it in my mind that the le those are the fixtures I want to do my, in my global dimmer effect with. I can hit edit on an empty tile, load predefined, dimmer sign, and I can edit this uh, effect line And we can look in the layout view and see, okay, well now we've got like an entire rig doing some movement. And that's pretty cool, I think. We can change the wings to like two. We can have it go from the center out or in, outward to inward, excuse me. And I could even change it to a PWM form and make it like really fast from right to left. Let's make the width like 20 and then change the speed to like 100. Okay, I could even store that, instead of putting it in a fader somewhere, I could just store that to flash button. And so now I can use that at any time. To create a cool chase that goes across the whole rig. Now let me show you something even more mind blowing. <laughs> If, so I'll call this rig chase. If I copy this, create a new button right next to it. So they're doing the same thing, right? They're doing the exact same thing. But I assign one of these worlds to the second button. Let's say I'm just gonna assign the color force. So now we've got a new little orange icon. That means that only that color force world will play back from our rig chase. Okay, if you don't think that's the coolest thing ever, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I just think that is so cool. I think I can even change this to a swap. So let's change the function to swap. So now it'll turn everything else off and do that chase with the color forces in the background, or I can chase the whole rig or just the background. I think like that is maybe the, that's why worlds are so versatile. I wish more people used them and understood them. Okay, let's see, what do we got? Where are we, where are we going next? What's, what's the next uh, big idea here? Uh, we got most of the basics down, presets are good. Remember presets, uh, you should understand the concept of these if you do anything with lighting. If you update the presets, it updates everything else in the show file where you use those presets. Um, what else can I go into like a 10,000 foot view on with this console? There's just so much to learn. Um, so we've got our atomics with their intensity and separated out. Got our gobo rotation, got our house lights. Let me think here, what could be a good, good topic? Uh, we went over effects. Oh, let's go over fixing. So let's say that you want to be able to keep one set of faders always on your active faders, right? So say you start building a show and you, you want to access more faders, but still have your same, like your main staples, like always available. So like your first five faders, you want them to always, <coughs> excuse me, losing my voice. You want them to always stay here. It's called the fix key. So you fix, 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 fix. Now, no matter what page you're on, they will remain as a floating fader, right? Okay, um, yeah, let's see, what else can we talk about? Um, oh, so uh, presets, if you tap them once, again, that's like it acts as select fix, right? So if we go tap cell fix preset 4.7, if you double tap, it'll bring every fixture that has that preset, va those preset values in them uh, to that preset. 
So you can busk using presets. I don't really recommend it. Um, you can do like program time with little fades and things like that. That could be useful. Um, I almost never use programming. Program time, however. Uh, yeah, I think that's honestly like a pretty good start for you guys. Um, make sure to always check the predefined effects. There's just so much in here that you can go off of. It's like flyouts, crosses, bitmaps, all sorts of stuff. Um, but yeah, this should be a great jumping off point for you. Um, if you found this useful, um, make sure to like, subscribe, uh, buy a hoodie, <laughs> go check out my Patreon, anything like that. Um, yeah, this should give you a really good like crash course. Um, I, I, I kind of call this like the, the oh shit tutorial where like you don't have time to really figure anything out on a, a deep level, but you need that like 10,000 foot view of everything. Um, hopefully this gave you a, uh, enough information to make a show happen. Um, that's kind of what this is all about and give you a good jumping off point for um, continuing your programming education. So yeah, thanks for watching guys. Uh, hope you enjoyed the video and I'll probably be doing a part two where we go a little bit deeper into this exact setup. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.